Hello and welcome to this LIU 12 Learn On Asynchronous session, which is on engagement with choice and feedback. My name is Nicole Bond. I'm the Educational Technology Specialist here at Lincoln Intermediate Unit 12. If you need to reach me, you can see my email here on this particular slide. Additionally, if you are looking to access these slides, which I highly encourage because I'm going to be going out to a couple of different places, um, you will notice down here at the bottom of the slide deck this particular bit.ly link. Um, if you are on the Learn On website, the slide deck will probably be able to be found with this recording, but if you are viewing this via YouTube, you may want to use this particular bit.ly. So you have your bit.ly link, capital L, capital I, capital U, 12, capital E, engage, to access the slide deck with all of the links and resources which I'm gonna go over and talk to you guys about today. So if this is your first time viewing one of our asynchronous videos or recorded webinars, you will find that it is easy and convenient to be able to pause or stop them as you need to. This means when I'm demonstrating something or if I'm going somewhere, you can hit pause, follow along in another tab or another window, and check out the same resource while I'm talking about it or explaining it. There will be office hours that are available after the session is posted, so please go back to our Learn On website and look at the calendar so you can get an idea of when they are. You can also reach out to me, so if there's something that you have a pressing question, please, again, my email, I just showed you, nabond at iu12.org, um, ask me that question, shoot me an email, and I will try to get back to you as soon as I can. Um, again, don't forget that this is down here at the bottom, it's at the bottom of most of the slides, so if you reconsider yourself. So today we're going to focus on engagement, and I want to think a little bit about engagement in terms of choice and feedback for students, but the first thing we want to pause and really think about um, is what engagement really looks like, because what it looks like in our classroom can be very different from what we're seeing maybe in an asynchronous session or in any number of different um, blended or hybrid learning environments which we are facing currently. So think for a second what engagement looks like in your classroom typically, what it maybe looked like um, back last fall, in the fall of 2019, fond memories. Um, and maybe what engagement looked like when you had to go online this past spring um, in maybe April, what engagement looked like. So when we talk about engagement, um, sometimes we have to pause and say, okay, what does disengagement look like? So disengagement might look like um, a student not paying attention, but sometimes that isn't why that what's actually happening in the classroom. So if we're looking at the causes of disengagement, then maybe we can understand engagement a little bit more. So often when a student is disengaged, there can be a lot of factors. It can be a combination. It can be one of these factors. But typically I find um, in my own classroom when I was teaching that it was a combination of these where the student maybe didn't feel connected. It could be that they didn't feel connected to the class that they were in, or they didn't feel connected to their, to their, to their teacher, or they didn't feel connected to the school at all. And that, that disconnection breeds that disengagement. Um, the student didn't feel any urgency, as if there was no real, like, why do I got to do this now? Like, why is this important? So they didn't necessarily see the importance or the urgency of the topic or the content or the task. Um, a student may not feel like they have any power, like, I'm just here to do what you tell me to do. That might be a reason that a student is disengaged. It might be uh, that the teacher is just constantly talking, <laughs> which can be hard, I find, a lot of times as an educator, to stop talking and let students do their talking. Um, it could be that the teacher isn't differentiating, so the student feels disengaged because maybe the content isn't, at a, isn't scaffolded in a way to help them learn. It could be that they feel like they just have to get through the learning. I know right now I have an eight-year-old at home, and, and that's how he feels about online learning right now, is I just got to get through this. It just needs to be done. If I get done, then I can go play Minecraft, or I can go do this, or I can do that. Um, and they have this feeling of, I just got to get this done. Um, it could be that there are a ton of life obstacles, so that's one of those things we have to be mindful of that when a student's struggling or, or not engaged, it might be because something else is really taking over what their, their thinking capacity, taking over their mind. Um, and a student can also feel disengaged if they're constantly being reminded of their failures, that they're not succeeding, um, that they can't succeed is what they start to think about if they're constantly being reminded of those failures. So when we're talking about engagement and what it looks like in our classrooms, it looks a little bit different depending on what kind of classroom you're in. So when we're in a classroom where it's teacher-directed, so the teacher is directing the learning in the classroom, 
um, this is kind of what it would look like. A lot of times we'll, we'll look around and we'll see, oh, the student's making eye contact with me. So they are definitely paying attention to what we're doing. Like I'm laughing and joking and getting a response out of the class. There's a rapport there. I, I make a joke, they laugh, they might say something back and we have a conversation between us. Um, that when I ask students, hey, get your notebooks out and turn the page, they do it. Um, and maybe when they're taking notes or working on something at their seats, um, we see completion. They're working on the task, they're adding to their notes when, I, when prompted, they're doing those activities at our seats when we ask them to. And then we have like the idea of calling and responding. And I ask a question and I have students raise their hand. Or if I have another procedure where it's cold call and I draw popsicle sticks or something like that, students will respond when they're called on. Um, we're also used to the call and respond, right? Or where I say one thing out loud, the students repeat the answer back to me. Those are ways that we know that we're engaging our students in our classroom when we're face to face. We can see it, and we can also notice the students who are maybe not responding when we do the call and respond, who are not raising their hand, who are having trouble doing that, that seat work, or are having trouble paying attention. You make a joke and they're like, huh, what's going on? So those are things that we can see as teachers, and a lot of educators who maybe have been in the classroom for a little while almost do it as second nature. You don't even think about it. You're already paying, as, you, as you're teaching, you're paying attention. Oh, yeah, he looks like he might be a little off task. I'm gonna walk over there to that corner, make sure I'm, I'm in his zone so he recognizes that I'm here and he, he maybe engages a little bit more. So those teacher-directed ways of knowing engagement, I just have to say one thing before we move on to student engagement is to be careful. You have to ask yourself sometimes, is this engagement or am I students just complying? Are they just doing what I said because I said it? or because they're actually engaged with what I've given them, that they're actively learning, or are they just responding because that's what I asked them to do? So sometimes a little bit of reflection there is really important. And then in a student-directed scenario, which we do go between both, there is no one total always student-directed or always teacher-directed, that, that balance of, of going between both, your engagement might look a little bit different there. So when we have our students directing their learning, when they're at, at, at their desks or the lab tables learning, um, there are a number of different ways that we see that engagement. So we, we see them reading and annotating the text when they're, when they're working at their seats. If they're writing, you know, you can see them brainstorming, you can see them reflecting, perhaps blogging, um, some level of problem solving at their, at their seats. When you see them, you may have them performing or presenting. They may be sharing their learning with the class and it might be from a group setting where they're sitting with their table mates and they're all sharing amongst each other. It might be as a presentation to the entire class or it might be sharing their learning with an outside audience, with a parent. You, you find out, hey, you know, a parent sends you an email, a student was really talking about what they learned in class today, and they were so excited at the dinner table last night. That might be something that you're seeing. Um, and they're interacting with others, that group discussion, the idea of collaboration, and even sometimes in our classrooms movement, where they're moving from station to station or desk to desk to work with other people or work with other instances or tasks that you've placed out for them. So those are things that we see in our classroom. So it can be really, really hard when we're not seeing our students in our classroom to determine, are they really engaged with what I'm giving them and how can I get them engaged if they're not? Because I'm not there to help you know, walk over to their side of the classroom and re-engage them. I'm not there to redirect them if they're sitting in their group discussion and maybe not being compelled by what, what their classmates are saying. So that can be a really, really difficult task. Engagement means that the students are active that they're active in their learning, whether they're physically active or mentally active, they're engaged, they're active in that learning. They're thinking and processing what's being given to them. They may be adding to it, um, synthesizing it in some way. So on this particular slide, I've included some links out to the ISTE standards videos, which will walk you through a couple of other ideas having to do with engagement um, and engaging ways to engage students um, with the ISTE standards. I am gonna keep moving through here though to go over some of the causes of engagement that we know work in our classrooms. So first, when students feel protected and encouraged in our classrooms, when they feel like they belong, that's one of the causes of engagement. When they feel respected, and respect isn't something that's earned. Respect is something that the students get as soon as they walk into your classroom. Uh, they shouldn't feel like I have to earn my teacher or my classmates respect. They should feel respected as soon as they walk in. That's one way to make sure that they're engaged, that they're accepted for their whole self, regardless of who they are and what they believe, that you accept them and their class accepts them for their whole self, that they're challenged in the classroom. And this can be a balance. Sometimes too much challenge can be a cause of disengagement, um, but they do feel like, hey, you know, I'm learning. This is something new. I'm not just repeating the same thing that I've learned the past three years or the past three months. This is a challenge. I'm learning 
something new. Um, they feel like they matter. And I think sometimes when, when we think about this matter piece, we, let, we focus on the you to you, your class and their classmates, like, hey, they matter to me, I'm their teacher, I'm their cheerleader. Um, and they matter to their class and their classmates wanna know what they're doing and, and why they're important. But especially I think as we start to move through the grade levels, um, and I see this in elementary, but I think it's especially important when we start to move into those secondary grades into the middle school and high school grades, that they matter in some way to the world, that they're connected to the world. Most of them are walking around in high school with a cell phone in their pocket. They have the world at their fingertips. They wanna know that they matter to that world. And if we don't give them the opportunity or the channel to engage with the world um, through their learning, I think we're doing them a great disservice. And that can actually be an area of disengagement for students because they don't feel like what they're doing in class matters to the world. Meanwhile, they're on their phone and they can see other people doing things on social media that they think matters to the world. So think about how you can bridge that gap um, the idea of letting them matter not just to you in their class, but perhaps in a, in a larger scale, sphere, in more of a global connectedness. They also feel that they can be successful, that in your classroom, even if they're small in successes, you celebrate those successes and they know they can be successful. Even if they struggle, you know that at some point they're going to be successful and that you're there to help them become successful. And lastly, are they really having fun? Um, fun can be hard because I know a lot of educators, and including myself, I'm not here to entertain you. You're here to learn my concept. But whenever we can make it fun, by that element of joking around, by um, engaging in gameplay when we can, um, that's also going to help with that engagement aspect. So this is where the crux really is, is this move to online engagement. You can't necessarily move around the room when you have a set of images in front of you that is just your students' faces sitting in their homes. You can't show up in their house and be like, I need to check this answer again. Um, because you, you have a screen between you and them, um, or your learning management platform. And so it becomes really challenging to, to engage the students because you don't feel like you can use all those things you did in the classroom. That idea of telling a joke really fast to kind of test to see who's really paying attention. You can't necessarily cold call as easily. Maybe synchronously you can a little bit, but it's hard. It's really hard to cold call on somebody synchronously because you, in some ways you don't know what they're dealing with at home. What other distractions? You wouldn't call on a student who was being distracted by something that was seriously happening um, in a classroom that they were focused on otherwise, if you because you have the whole picture in the classroom because they're in the room with you. But at home, they're not in the room with you. You don't know what's going on in the background. So it can be really hard to do some of the, the techniques that we learn face-to-face -face when we're online. So some of the techniques I'm gonna give you with choice and feedback today are ways to try to help draw students into that online engagement, um, whether you're doing hybrid, blended, or face-to-face -face learning, these are great tools to have in your pocket because choice and, and feedback also work face-to-face. -face. They help build that idea of community amongst your students. They make the students feel valued and that they have some say in what they're learning. So these are tools, again, that work either way, online or face-to-face. -face. Um, you can use all of these resources. So the first thing I want you to do is stop and think for a second about how you feel when you're powerless. Because I think a lot of us felt this way in the spring. Um, when, when we moved online, it may not have been a decision that you had any, any say in. And the same may be true for you in the fall, that you feel in many ways powerless to do anything. Um, and typically, when you feel powerless, you will do one of the two. You will underfunction and shut down. This is where you withdraw because you feel powerless. Um, or you may overfunction to gain control. Like, I don't have control of what's going on. I'm going to do my best to control everything else possible in my entire world. I dance between the two, all right? I may go into a mood where I'm completely under function and shut down and give up, or I may over function, like, well, what can I control? And I get to the point where I'm controlling which socks go into the laundry, all right? It gets out of control. Um, so I want you to think about this in perspective of the students. Um, in your classroom, whether they're face-to-face -face or hybrid or, or even online, how powerless do they feel about this situation? We know how powerless we feel as educators. You know, we know how it feels not to be in control of, of where our classroom may be, if it's online, hybrid, face-to-face, -face, et cetera. Um, but imagine you're a student and you're facing that level of powerlessness um, where you don't know if you're going to school or if you're not at school or if you're at school some days and not other days or if school may change tomorrow and you're online. So when we think about engagement and engaging our students, um, that's something to keep in mind, um, that idea of powerlessness. And one of the ways we can combat that powerlessness 
is to allow our students to have a little bit of ownership. They can't have ownership of where or how they're learning in some small way. I wonder how many more will shut down because they feel powerless. So, or they will try to overfunction and try to gain control, and it might be not in a way that you want to direct them. So that's one of the reasons that choice and ownership are really important as an online tool to have in our pocket and a face-to-face -face tool to have in our pocket. When students are dealing with a lot of things, sometimes giving them a little bit of choice in what direction they're going is really going to help enable them and engage them to learn. So encouraging them to make their own decisions about how they want to move forward. And it shows them that you respect them, especially when you start to get into those the middle school and your high school students. They want to know that they're being respected. They want to know that they have some power, um, especially in their learning, and that their thoughts and their choices do matter. They matter not only to them, but to you. So I want to address this troubling truth because this isn't even necessarily related to online learning or, or hybrid learning. It's just learning in general that ninth graders who have spent their whole life being told what to learn, some of them don't even know what they're interested in because they haven't been given the opportunity. So this comes back to the idea of, of choice and decision making. The more that students are allowed to choose and experiment with their learning, the more likely they're going to know what they like and what they don't like. So when we give them an opportunity to choose, they can discover things like, you know what, I'd rather read that passage than view it because I process better, I understand better, or it just works better because I'm in a situation where I can't put earbuds in. So situations like that where we give them a little bit of choice and content might help with these sorts of things. And this particular piece of research from Hanover Research that um, researchers highlighted the fact that autonomy is generally associated with greater personal well-being and satisfaction in educational environments, as well as in terms of academic performance. So this idea of increasing engagement really comes from the fact that if we give our learners a little bit of autonomy, a little bit of ability to, to make choices about how they learn or what they learn, we may be able to empower them so that they feel better about the learning, satisfied, engaged, so when we talk about adding choice, the first thing I want to do is say that we always have to start with our goal in mind, whether it's your standards or your anchors or your essential questions or your skills. Start with that first and say, okay, this is what I need these learners to come out of this experience knowing or understanding or doing. So identify those knows and those understands and those do's first before you start to add your choice. Because if you start there, then you can add all the choices that lead there. We always begin with the end in mind. We also wanna start small. If you're not someone who has used choice in your classroom or you are facing a new group of students, starting small with those either or choices is gonna be a great place for you to start so that you don't feel overwhelmed as an educator, but also for the students to start so they don't feel overwhelmed. I like to think about it this way. Sometimes you go to a restaurant and they give you a menu and it's one page and you've got five things. And those five things might be interesting or they might be elaborate dishes so that five is enough because the dishes are so elaborate when you look at that menu. And sometimes you go to a restaurant and they, <laughs> they lay down a, a 10 page book and then they're like, what would you like? Within five minutes, the, the waitress is there asking you, oh, so what are you gonna have today? Um, and you're still on page three. So, Think about it that way. Think about those moments where you felt overwhelmed by choice. Be careful with the choice. Start small with either or choices with your students so that they're not overwhelmed. Um, but also as you go, you can start to build out choices. It's never worthwhile to give students a massive book of choices to choose from. Keeping it narrow is going to keep them from becoming overwhelmed because it's important to have choice, but it's also important not to overwhelm the choice. And as the students start to become comfortable, start to think about how they can drive the learning. Start to open up and say, okay, up until this point, I've given you two choices. If you would like to drive the learning with your own ideas, please see me, let's talk about it. You might have an idea that didn't even occur to me. Um, and opening it up so that they can drive their learning is gonna be empowering as well. But again, you can't start there. If you start with, you know, day one, unit one, all right guys, tell me what you wanna learn. Students may not know how to go into a direction, but if you guide them the first for the first few units or projects or lessons, et cetera, you can start to open it up because they start to become more confident in their own ability to choose. 
Another piece that we want to keep in mind, especially when we're dealing with this digital learning component, is giving choice based upon bandwidth. So when we have students who are maybe not face-to-face -face with us, thinking about, okay, the choices I'm giving my students, are they choices that meet not only those, those engagement needs, um, but also the needs of the technology where they are? Am I meeting them where they are um, from a technological standpoint? So if I'm choosing something, such as right now I've chosen asynchronous pre-recorded video, which is up here, you see it's in low immediacy, but it is in high bandwidth. And if I knew my students didn't have bandwidth, this might not be the best way for me to deliver this material. Or if I knew my students are in blend, that some of my students have really great internet at home and some of them don't, maybe I want to include this pre-recorded video, but I also want to include text that goes with it. Maybe that's one of the reasons I have a slideshow as well as this presentation. Um, but think about it that way. How can I hit both those options up here at the top and those options down here at the bottom whenever I can to make sure that my students, no matter their bandwidth, can they have a choice. So their choice might be driven by their interests um, and their passions, um, as well as the way that they learn, but those choices may also be driven by their bandwidth and what they can actually access. So when we think about choice as an educator, the first place I wanna go is the choice in content. This is educator as curator, right? I'm finding all the resources and I'm putting them out in front of you in the way I want you to look at them and consume them. So this idea of us finding multiple resources um, and using multiple tools. Now, I will give you a word of caution. I have a lot of resources in here, but you should not be using them. Really, you wanna keep it really, really tight. Three to five, max, is where you wanna go. You have maybe your learning management system where you put your resources digitally or whatever your learning hub or your restaurant might be for all of these resources. But you truly do not want to have students interacting with more than three to five resources, especially at the beginning. Start with a solid three to five so that everybody gets their footing in the same resources. They all know how to log in. They all know how to access and they all know what your expectations are with those resources. It can be overwhelming to see a list of 10 different resources. So remember how I said about that either or, or choice at the beginning? The same is true when we look at digital resources. Start with kind of either or choices. Don't go leaping into you can consume things in 20 different ways. So if I, I look at this, here on the left you see the text fiction and nonfiction. So a couple of these resources are great for fiction and nonfiction. Newzella has a lot of a lot of nonfiction, um, which is open whether you're paying for it or not, paying for it or not, as well as some fiction pieces. And Common Lit has a collected resource of multiple resources or of multiple types of text as well. And all of these are clickable links. So if I click on Common Lit or we'll go out here, you'll see a little bit about the curriculum. We'll go to the library. I can browse by book as an ELA teacher if I'm looking for resources that go with the book or I can browse by genre or grade level, ELA teachers, literary device, tech set. So I like tech set, especially for my um, my humanities, and my, my ancient civ. There's several pieces in here. Theme, and then they even have a collection of Spanish texts. So this is one great free resource that you can use. Um, Newzella also has tons of great resources when we're talking about fiction and nonfiction. Oh, that's loading. And Actively Learn. Actively Learn even has some novels in it. Now, Newzella and Actively Learn are freemium. There's things that are available for free in those two, but there's also things that are, that are available for a cost. When we talk about video, I, we often talk about YouTube and YouTube Kids. I would encourage you not to overlook PBS Learning Media. PBS Learning Media does a fantastic job of curating resources based on subjects, and you don't have to worry about advertisements or it becoming kind of what I call like the clicking hole where you, oh, that, that video looks interesting, that video looks interesting, and you keep going um, based upon suggestions which follow the initial video. And then you have Edpuzzle, which will allow you to embed those YouTube videos and create assessments. We have some tutorials on Edpuzzle on our Learn On website, so I'm not gonna go into greater detail there. 
And then you may or may not have access to Discovery Education, which is a paid for resource. Discovery Education, which I will note, and again, we have several resources that will walk you through exactly how to use Discovery Education on our Learn On website. Um, they also have images, audiobooks, and podcasts, and um, they have reading passages. So if you do have access and you haven't been into Discovery Ed recently, I'd really encourage you to go in and check that one out as well. So the idea of maybe choosing a piece over here in Common Lit and then finding a video that goes with it, I would even um, comment that in some cases Common Lit even makes suggestions. If you go into some of their content, you might find a video that, that pairs with it. So a choice of here's the text or here's a video explaining this concept. All right, the idea of maybe going into curated lessons. So Khan Academy has complete, completely curated lessons which you can assign. And so does CK12, which is a digital free online textbook and open education resource. And then OER Commons, which has tons of open education resources. We have podcasts, all right, maybe having the student do a lesson or listen to a podcast. Um, so ListenWise is a great resource for podcasts. If you're looking for short ones, almost all of these are short, no advertising, and some of them even come with questions to have students consider or think about their learning. We'll click out to listen wise and let that load a little bit. Additionally, Penna is another um, resource which has some free podcasts. There is a little bit, um, it's freemium, so certain things need to be paid for. And StoryCorps is another great resource which has a number of different interviews with people. Um, some of them are, are actually created into videos which are animated, um, but it's a great resource for storytelling and listening to stories. So here's Penna. If I go over to lessons, you'll see there's several different. I'm going to just go to current events, and you'll see you can join for free, but you'll see it has uh, resources in here, and you'll see down here there's a podcast in here and some listening comprehension questions. Log in real fast so you can get a better look at it. So, it's loading over here. But you see it's only about morning, 30 Rachel. seconds. So they're quick consumable, easy to share audio bits. And then the other piece you want to think about is how you're curating this, so how you're putting it together. And I'm going to go into a little more depth with the choice menus and playlists at a moment, but think about what, how your learning management system is set up. Um, if you're using Google Classroom or Canvas or Schoology or Teams or what, whatever you're using, think about how it's set up and how you can offer choice in it. So when you push out an assignment, can you say, I want you to choose one or the other and do this? and say, okay, I want you to view this video or listen to this podcast, links to either one, and then do this task. The task could be a task that they could do regardless of which consumable that they uh, they visit. So that might be one way to do it. Um, you can use a Google site as a virtual textbook. Actually, I have a webinar coming up on that. If you're looking for that, that'll be posted in the next two weeks, hopefully. Um, and you can find that on the Learn On calendar. And then Wakelet, which is another great resource for curating um, links to things to build your own sort of playlist. And then I'm going to go into choice menus and playlists in a second because I have so many resources on that. So one of the things you want to think about as a curator when you're curating for choice and content is what your sources of digital content really are. Um, what resources do you have to go to that you can give students a little bit of choice in how they consume the content? Um, how can you find or make what isn't digital into digital. And I know a lot of educators who are working really hard with um, their PDFs and what to do with their PDF worksheets. All right, can you make that into maybe a, a, a Word document? Can you copy it into a Word document? Or can you make it more engaging by offering a video that goes with the PDF? Can you find related content in another media form? So maybe you want to give them an opportunity to choose to extend their learning. How can you find um, another media form? And again, I have those resources that I just talked about. They're all linked in the slide deck, which are down here. And then lastly, I just want to remind you not to be overwhelming. Remember, remember the giant menu that you get that's 10 pages long that you, you have to read through. You're going to become overwhelmed by choice and not know what you want to eat. Right? The same is true with students. If you curate too many meals and give them all to them and say, choose what you want, 
they're going to become overwhelmed and not know how to engage necessarily. But that idea of choice is kind of, it might be an engagement tool that you definitely want to use. Um, if you are looking to connect on your content area, I have several different resources linked in here, which you can um, click to, which are going to take you out to some social media pieces. One of the ways that in my classroom, I curated choice was actually to look and see what other teachers were already doing um, and to collaborate and say, hey, I'm already doing this unit on this. I need something that complements it or I need a video that will that would be a better choice than this particular passage. Has anybody found anything? And one of the things I did is I went to Facebook groups. Um, I was a secondary ELA teacher. I taught seventh and eighth grade English language arts. So secondary ELA was one of my favorite places to go to find resources. And it was full of educators who were sharing their, their resources, their lessons, their assignments for free. All right. So for those of you who think about teachers pay teachers, I wasn't paying for anything. Um, I was finding all of this for free. And a lot of times I could just post a question and say, hey, does anyone have any resources for this? Or I could go to the search bar and type in the content area and all of the, all of the comments or posts in it um, related to that to that topic would come up. So don't overlook social media. Also searching Twitter using a hashtag is another great way to find some resources if you're looking for it. Or if you post if you have an active professional learning network on Twitter, posting something with one of these hashtags will sometimes draw out other folks who might have answers for you. And I've included several links. So this link down here is a link to different kinds of hashtags that you can add to your posts or um, search if you're looking for, for a piece. All of these are links to these groups if you are a Facebook person. Um, so don't overlook social media. I know that social media can be um, overwhelming and that some teachers feel as though, and I completely understand um, that maybe that's more of a personal life and not a professional life area. Please balance it, use best judgment when using social media if you choose to use that to connect, but it is a fantastic resource um, and it really should not be overlooked if you're looking for ideas. So the other way we talk about choice is with student as a creator. So we have the choice in the content, like you can watch or listen or read or engage in this way with an interactive um, game. And then there's the student as creator. This is how you can show me your learning. So when we talk about students showing their learning, again, the same thing about tech tools and digital tools applies, right? Less is more, especially in the beginning. Three to five, max. So think about what might work in your classroom. Um, a couple of interesting resources that you might want to consider. First would be Adobe Spark for education. One of the reasons I like Adobe Spark is that it has multiple tools built into one resource. So Adobe Spark for education, see there's multiple ways to have students log in. will allow students to build a number of different pieces. My little image here. So students can build, I mean, Instagram. <laughs> they have the social media component, photo collages, presentations, slideshows, all sorts of different things that they can build in here, along with resources on how to. So from graphics to Plus. So flyers, videos can be built in here, and web pages and collages. So when you think about having your student do something, say create a flyer for something um, as an advertisement, or maybe you want them to create a picture collage that explains the story um, through images, or maybe you want to do a video that does the picture collage with recording their audio in the background and do it that way, or maybe you want them to create an interactive web page. So you see with one tool, I've got several things that I can do. I can do infographics, videos, web pages, flyers. Um, and I only have to really orient students to one tool to do it. So that's what we really want to be looking for when we're thinking about our tools and our digital resources, guys, is how can we find one tool that gives me multiple bangs for my buck, all right? Not just you know one tool who does one thing. We want it to be a robust tool that it can engage students in multiple ways and allow them to choose, make a choice in product that might be different types of products. All right, the other resource I would think about is Flipgrid. Um, I know a lot of times we as educators have been using Flipgrid for that um, discussion piece or to have students uh, answer verbally and summarize. But I want you to also think about Flipgrid in a couple of other different ways because Flipgrid will allow you 
as a student to share your screen so that students can actually do presentations via Flipgrid, depending on how you set it up. So I'm gonna log in so I can show you really quickly. So you'll see I have tons of different groups. A group is like a class, or you can do like period one, group A, period one, group B, period one. So sometimes I keep my groups small, um, or sometimes I do a group as a whole class of students. And then within the groups, you build your topics, which used to be your grids, they changed into topic. So I'm just gonna go into a group that I already have to make it easier. And I'm gonna go here to add a topic. And this is where I can build my topics. So one of the things I wanna point out is one, I can increase this to 10 minutes. So if I want my students sharing presentations, they can do so in Flipgrid and see each other's presentations. If I, if I say the limit's 10 minutes, you can do your presentation in 10 minutes. Um, you can keep it simple like so. I can record a video of me explaining. Um, in fact, I'm gonna do that so you can see the tools that students can see. So one of the things I wanna point out is this is how it, it sets up even for students. But under here, under options, I can do a couple of things. I can one, upload a clip. So if I've got a clip perhaps of something that I wanna share, I can upload that clip. I can mirror the video and I can also record my screen. So one of the things you wanna point out to your students if you decide to use it for presentations is that ability to share screen. But it's also great to share screen if maybe you have students working in groups to collaborate on, say, math problems where they're sharing, hey, this is where um, how I solved this particular problem. Or if you have students sharing their written work and they want to highlight um, written pieces in it as well. So just keep in mind, I can do a couple of different things under options, and your students will have that ability as well when you're using Flipgrid. So it makes Flipgrid a somewhat robust tool. Additionally, if you're looking at Flipgrid and you're not sure how you want to use things, going into Discovery, it's gonna show you a couple of other ideas, um, including prompts like from Epic, um, Nearpod, the News Literacy Project, all sorts of different resources in through here, including trending topics and collections, including conversation starters. So definitely go in here and explore. You might be surprised um, at how robust Flipgrid can be as a tool when it comes to students being creators when it comes to choice in product. Another resource might be EduBlogs, which will allow you to create a class blog to share. Um, share your ideas, your research, your stories, solutions to problems. That's another way students can share their, their product. Book Creator is a great, if you're in Apple school or your students have iPads, they can use the tool called Book Creator to create books. Though I've seen folks use even Google Slides to create book, books. Tour Builder to build virtual field trips. Um, and then the idea of maybe having students build a website. But again, what my suggestion is to go for the most robust tools, the ones that you can use in the most, the most number of ways that are most flexible for you. So explore the tools and create a menu that you know that you want your students to be familiar with. If you have face-to-face, -face, get those students in oriented to those tools right away, all right? Have them doing low-risk activities in them, all right? Doing flip grids to like do quick check-ins or tell me about your favorite ice cream or your favorite dessert or your favorite animal, et cetera, et cetera. Thinking about how you can use them casually for building community um, before allowing it to drive your content and your student products. So get them into Adobe Spark and say, I want you to create a video telling me about um, your favorite experience so far in this class or experience so far over the summer or experience so far in the last five years or, or somebody who created an Adobe Spark video or flyer about somebody who's really important to you. Or if you were to create something, um, a product and had to advertise it, create an advertisement, advertising a useless product which you think would be um, really funny or something to drive that idea of community and creativity. So you get them in the tool, figuring out the tool now um, as soon as possible before you get to a virtual flip if you have it or before you get to that hybrid learning if you have it. If you find that you're already virtual or hybrid, one of the things that I like to do is just create really quick tutorials and share those before I have the students go in. So I use a screencasting product like Screencastify to do that. If you're looking for more ideas on content or on students being creators of content um, and you're looking at the tools themselves, again, think about how you connect can connect on those tools. Most of those tools have a Twitter. 
right? So you see Flipgrid's there, Edublog, or Edublogs, Wix, Google for Edu is always posting different things. Adobe Spark has their own Twitter. And also on the left under Facebook, all of these tech integrator sites, there are entire groups that are devoted to just one tool. There's an entire Facebook group called Flipgrid Educators, where it's just teachers using Flipgrid and all the different ways that they use it. So adding yourself to groups like this might expose you, even when you're not looking, to ideas you didn't even think about. So just another suggestion, all of these are links out to these locations if you're looking for resources. So again, I'm gonna remind you when you are adding that choice, whether you are adding the choice in content or you're adding the choice in product, think about your goal. Begin with the end of mind. What's your standard, your anchor, your essential question, the skill that you want the student to leave with? So when you start to build these ideas, there are a couple of different ways, or build choice, there are a couple of different ways to build choice in. Some of my favorite ones are the ideas of choice menus um, and allowing students, you can build your actual menu in there and say you can choose this way or you can choose that way. Another great resource for this is playlists. And this is the concept of, like, if you think back to when you would create a playlist, which I sometimes still do, but not that often, on, on an MP3 player, or on CDs, you might have everything, you know, in the order it needs to be to be listened to. With an MP3 player, you can change that order up and switch it around. So that idea of giving students a playlist, like, hey, you can choose how you want to listen to this, listen to this um, um, content, so to speak, or or you can reorder it, or that sort of thing. So I'm going to actually go into some of these because I think there's some fantastic ones. If you're familiar with choice menus, this one right up here is great because it's really a next level piece for student ownership. So for those of you who are exp experienced with um, choice menus and you want to know more, I highly suggest you come up here and check out John Spencer's uh, blog post about it because he talks a little bit about how you can amplify it and make it a more robust resource. If you're just getting into the idea of choice menus or interactive learning menus, I'm going to go in here because this is full of free templates. And I'm all about anything that will make my life a little bit easier when I'm trying to do so many different things and wear so many different hats in the classroom. So this is Casey Bell's Shake Up Learning. She's very Google-based. The nice thing about a Google-based um, board is that it's pretty adaptable um, and modifiable. So she explains what learning menus are. It's all about giving students kind of a menu to, to choose from. So when I was talking about menus and not giving students a book of, <laughs> of material, this is kind of what I had in mind with the, the menus here. So it's really about a student-centered strategy. And what you find down here are some examples. Now, this is clickable. So I can click on it and make a copy. Once I do that, there's a little link up here where I can make a copy. You can get the idea. It says start with number five and then make two other choices to make your tic-tac-toe. So this particular menu is a tic-tac-toe board for novel study. So you see all of these suggestions. There are a total of eight. So that does take some time to curate. But I can also, if I'm doing this, there might be a reason that I have blue and yellow. So I might, for a specific student, say, you know what, you can choose the five, but I want to make sure that you choose um, at least at least one, you know, one of a certain thing. Or I might say, you know what, you're not going to choose the five. I want you to only choose from the yellow topics or only choose from the blue topics. So I can also do a couple of different things when I do my choice board. I can make sure like all of my blue topics are a certain level of differentiation that might have a little more scaffolding um, than the yellow topics or vice versa. Now, in, in the case of a tic-tac-toe board, students are going to have to choose a yellow and a blue in this particular board. But think about how you might change it up into rows. Like, I want you to choose one thing from each row. And that's essentially what she did, because once you do five, you have to do, you do four and six or seven and three or one and eight, or eight and two. So you think about how that tic-tac-toe board works. It seems like it's a tic-tac-toe board, but really she's making sure that they get a blue and a yellow in their choice by making them choose five and then do all the other ones around it. So this is a fantastic example of a tic-tac-toe choice menu. And this, in this case, is a matter of product where she's giving the student choice in what they create or make to demonstrate their learning around a novel. You could also do something like this around a topic. If you think about it, we're, if you're in a situation where maybe you're teaching, say, World War II, create a choice board where there's one piece you definitely want them to know, and then other pieces having to do with World War II, maybe videos, news articles, museum exhibits online, 
um, related topics having to do with the strategy behind World War II, related topics having to do maybe more specifically with the Holocaust, related topics having to do more specifically with leaders that will allow them to choose some of the ways they consume the content. So this is a great example of how you might want to use a menu board. And again, this is based on a podcast, so she'll even walk you through it and explain everything up here in the podcast, usually. Unless it's, eh, that might be the most recent one. So there's a couple in here. This is a slightly different design. This is done with Google Chrome. It's a professional development for teachers. And down here, she has a more elaborate menu. So one of the other menus that I've seen before, I'm going to hopefully zoom in a little bit so you can see it is to do it like this, where students get to choose appetizers, entrees, and desserts, where instead of um, necessarily a tic-tac-toe board, say, okay, here are your appetizers. You can choose from these three appetizers, which are maybe smaller tasks that you have students doing. And then you can choose one of these entrees and then choose one of these desserts. So you'll see in here that this is an example. I'm not necessarily really appreciate this example, but in this case, it's meant as a PD where, as an appetizer, teachers can discover Screencastify, Wii Video, or Vakaroo, their choice. They can choose an entree, so they can choose Google Slides, Google Docs, Powtoon, Education, et cetera. And you see how it flows. I might design mine a little bit differently, but you can create your own copy of the template and tweak it, or this might inspire you to make your own. So that's another one. Here's a bingo board. That might be similar where you say, okay, I need you to do five in a row, where I might be offering a little more choice. I think the easiest one to start with might be this tic-tac-toe board, but don't negate those other two boards. Again, there's links in here so you can click and make a copy and make it work for your classroom and your students and modify it how you need to modify it and adapt it for your students. So I'm gonna go back here to engagement with choice. So those are your interactive learning menus. And there's more here from Jennifer Gonzalez if you're looking for some more ideas. But I'm gonna go down here to Playlist because this is another great resource. So this is based upon um, a podcast and you can see that right here if you wanna actually listen to the podcast, it is right here where they'll explain how it's used and, and what it's used with. The idea of a playlist is that you curate a roadmap for your students. Um, and this particular teacher use this in class, face-to-face -face with her students, and let it be student-directed learning, and then kind of conference and work with them one-on-one -on -one as they went through. So this is an example of an argumentative writing playlist. And you'll see over here to the left, you have the activity. So we'll zoom in a little bit, hopefully. And then you have the directions. So I want you to do this. And that's why you're going to do this. The notes section is meant for students to take notes about any questions they might have. And then they're supposed to complete where it says date, date completed. So you might want to modify this based upon what works for you. So the number two, looking at real world writing, choose one argument example. So you'll see how she worked choice in. This playlist is the directions of what the students need to do. But you'll see that they have a choice sometimes in what they're doing. Not in everything, but it's there. Notice how it's numbered. All right, creating a checklist or numbering the assignments really makes this easier for students to understand and consume when they're doing so digitally. Whether they're face-to-face -face or not face-to-face -face with you, um, that's going to help enable them to drive their own learning, know what they need to do next. And you'll notice how she highlighted where there might be directions like choice or what they need to do next, like check-in with Mrs. Enos. So one of the things you might want to think about is how can I build my lessons like this, and create times for students to check in with me. If I'm in a hybrid, blended learning environment, how can they? How can I do that so that I'm checking in with students as they're working through? Or, and for the students who aren't there, how can I check in online? All right? How can I create office hours, a schedule where I'll check in, and instead of maybe holding a Zoom session where I'm teaching a class for an hour, instead I'm holding 15-minute sessions where I'm meeting with two or three students at a time, saying, okay, well, tell me what where you're at. Tell me what you need feedback on. Show me where, where you're struggling, where you need more support. And having those or those little check-ins where maybe you're assessing them really quickly by asking them questions and having them show you or demonstrate their learning in small group settings versus the, the larger Zoom room, potentially. So all of these resources are in here. If you're familiar with choice menus, I really suggest this one up at the top. 
this is choice menus, this is choice menus, and this is choice menus down here. You'll find playlists right in here as the second Jennifer Gonzalez link on slide number 26 if you're looking for this slide in the slide deck. All right, the next piece I want to talk a little bit about is feedback and how we use feedback to engage our learners. So this is where that connection is, and it's really important that, yes, students get that immediate feedback that, say, a Google form or another digital assessment might give them by saying, this is right, this is wrong. But I think it's also important to give feedback on a personal level. And that might be um, from something like video or your voice or typing in comments. So there's a couple of different ways that we can give feedback that will engage with our students better, especially digitally. Um, that I'm gonna go into. This idea of feedback really does help students succeed. So in this particular research study, she found that many schools struggling to facilitate remote learning because students didn't have experience setting and meeting learning goals, and they didn't know how to think or plan and consider how their actions and progress one day would affect their workload the next. So that idea of the playlist that I showed you previously is one of the ways that we help meet these needs by setting that playlist. And we might say, hey, I need this done by this date, um, but it's really giving students that experience of being in control of getting their work done in a timely fashion that is so important when we're looking at possibly having to engage an online learner. But even if we think about face-to-face, -face, those are executive skills that they need in the real world. Often we have to set our own goals and we might have a deadline that's two weeks out, but we have to be able to find a way to manage our work and break it down. So take time to think about that experience and this opportunity to help our students learn how to drive those goals. So as I come back, I just wanna remind you of these different causes of engagement, that as we do feedback, we wanna remember that our students need to be protected and encouraged by our feedback. They wanna feel respected by their feedback, accepted when we, we give them feedback. We need to be challenging them, and we need them to make sure that they feel like they matter, and that even when I'm giving them feedback that might be constructive, that they need to work on something, they need to know that they can feel successful with that feedback. And when possible, have a little fun with it. So things we want to include in the feedback. First of all, we always want to begin with the positive because that's how we're going to engage them first. When they know they're getting some great feedbacks, some great positive feedback, they're going to keep reading. So it might be as simple as, I really appreciate you taking the time to complete this assignment. I know that this is hard, right? Recognizing that struggle, whether the struggle is the assignment itself or maybe the situation in which we're completing this assignment these assignments. Identify what specific aspects of the student's performance need to be improved, right? Go back to what your goal was for the assignment. Um, offer specific guidance and direction for making those improvements. Like maybe if you tried this or this resource might help you come up with this idea, right? Think about what those are and then express confidence in the student's ability to achieve. So even if you are critiquing and saying you need to um, correct this or complete this, Talk about, I'm so impressed that you worked so hard on this. Um, I think that if you try this, you're gonna be so successful. Be, be encouraging, because that encouragement is what's gonna help them keep working at it and keep getting better, especially when it's online and they may not have you there to have that encouragement conversation with them face-to-face, -face, where you maybe, you know, you see a student struggling, you stop at their desk and be like, hey, buddy, I know this is really hard, and you have a little bit of a pep talk. It's a lot harder to have that pep talk when you're, we're talking a little bit about virtual learning. So this might be um, something to keep in mind, a little post-it note you wanna put next to your desk when you're giving students feedback, ha having those pep talks, even when you don't know if they need that pep talk, but just including in your feedback anyway. So when we think about feedback, always return to that goal, the question, the standard, the skill. Begin with the end in mind. Are, how are they headed towards whatever that end is? All right, think about what the student really needs to achieve that. It might be different for each one. Can you offer additional feedback to challenge the student? Maybe they've already met that goal. You've given them an assignment and you maybe didn't estimate how long it would take or the fact that the student maybe already mastered that. How can you add an additional challenge for that student who might be like, man, I flew through this. And only, and in some cases, can you only offer feedback in one area? So I know sometimes as a ELA, former ELA teacher, I would read an essay and be like, oh my goodness, where do I begin? with giving students feedback, I would always start with one area that I think, you know what, this is an area the student could specifically be successful in. I could mark this whole thing with all of these other pieces, but what if I just said, hey, let's focus on this one thing that I want you to improve and only give feedback on that. Less is gonna be more. 
because it's not going to overwhelm the student who maybe is struggling to be a great writer or is struggling to understand a concept. If I can get them to understand a piece of that concept, that's success, and we need to celebrate that success one step at a time. How can I make it personal? So it doesn't seem like I'm using canned feedback that I've had stored away over and over and over again. How can I weave in some sort of personal aspect that has to do with me or them or a joke that we have going or their pets? And how can I make it as immediate as possible? This can be really hard when we're trying to personalize our feedback, but how can I schedule out how I'm offering feedback to assignments in a way that's immediate? And sometimes that's when we keep the feedback more of a face-to-face -face situation where maybe we have that Zoom meeting and instead of me necessarily having to type in all those feedback pieces, I have the Zoom meeting where I can offer that verbal feedback right to them face as face-to-face -face as a Zoom meeting might be. Or maybe we do the feedback part in class if I'm doing hybrid. They do the work and then we meet in class and have that conversation. Okay, what were you trying to do here? Or what are you trying to show me? Or what was your goal here? And have those conversations in class in the hybrid learning environment. The last thing I want to remind you is that no matter what your student turns in, and sometimes it's going to be very disheartening as a teacher, um, no matter what your student turns in, I want you to assume that your child, the student, is doing the best they can. We don't always know what's going on in that household or, or, or how they're even gaining access. They may be turning something in quickly because they have Wi-Fi for a couple of minutes today and they, have, they know they want to get it in and that's the best they can do. So stop, pause. Sometimes it can be really frustrating when we see something like, I know I taught that, why aren't you showing me that you learned it? Um, remind yourself that your students are doing the best they can under any circumstance that they're facing. They're doing the best they can and you're doing the best you can. Let that guide your decisions. So a couple of other ways that we can do feedback. One is that video aspect. I showed you Flipgrid a second ago. You can have those video conferences in Flipgrid. It allows for screencasting from the teacher and in replies from the student. It allows students to share their work with a video explanation. And it might be them sharing their work with maybe five other students if you break it into smaller groups. So you remember how I said a group can be a class. So think about how you could possibly break those groups into group A, group B, period one, group C, et cetera. And maybe that way students can work in those small group settings, share and video explain what they're doing. Another way that you can do feedback is through video yourself as an educator. I've been using Screencastify. Screencastify has a five minute limit, but let's be honest, if you're offering more than five minutes of feedback, is the student really gonna watch it all? So using Screencastify to video your face as you're reading it, or your screen as you're looking over the assignment and saying, oh, I see here this, and I see that you maybe need to adjust this, and maybe have you explored this question or that question. You can also do this with Loom and Screencast-O-Matic. I just prefer Screencastify, all of the screencasting softwares, and we have a, several of them linked into our Learn On website if you're looking for a tutorial, um, can help support that in your classroom. Once it renders, especially with Screencastify, you can literally just, it'll give you a Google Drive link and you can send the link to the students so that they can watch it. So just keep that in mind. That's what I particularly love about Screencastify. And then if you haven't heard of these two, um, using audio feedback is fantastic too. Vakaru is a really, really easy and great resource for um, audio. Literally, I don't even need a login. I can just hit this and start recording whatever it is I need to say. And then when I'm done, hit stop, go down to shape, save and share, and I have a link. Now, caveat, that link only lasts for a couple of weeks. So if it's something I need to last for longer, I might want to download it. But I can copy and paste that link as a comment in the Google Doc or as a message to a student. So I can do audio feedback and give them my verbal thoughts really quickly um, and send them the link. And so they have my voice for that personalized piece. Um, they have the audio recording that they can listen to again and again to get, their, get, get my ideas and my feedback. And it's pretty swift and nifty. Additionally, students can use it to communicate with me. So if they wanted to, to do the same thing, they could go to Vakaru and record really quickly and offer feedback. Moat is a slightly different, it's a Google Chrome integration, or it's a Google add-on that will go into doc, in the Google Docs and it will give you a short way of recording videos right into your Google Docs. But it requires both you and the student to have Moat um, as an add-on for it to be used effectively. So just keep that in mind. Bakaru is a little bit less of a lift. It's pretty straightforward. So when you can with feedback, especially if you're going, if you have a level of hybridized or virtual learning, you want to try to use your voice and your face because that's going to help students see your facial expression, your smile, etc. It's another way to connect with students when you're concerned about engagement. 
So coming back to those pieces of engagement, the idea that we want our students to be protected, encouraged, respected, accepted for their whole self, challenged, feel like they matter, that they can be successful and that they're having fun. We need to keep all of those in mind when we're offering feedback. I'm gonna give you one more tool for feedback and it is the single point rubric. It's a great way to conference with students and you can keep it very, very, very simple. So for instance, I might do my criteria or standard and have my students via Flipgrid or a Zoom conference explain to me how they met or proved that standard. This link right here will take you out to Jennifer Gonzalez's single point rubric webpage with the podcast and blog posts and et cetera for all of the details on how to use it. So I'm not gonna go through all of it. Again, I'm just giving you the resource. This is on slide 34 of this slide deck if you're still with me and watching. Again, this is the link down here. You'll just have to type that into your, um, into your web browser and it will take you right to this particular slide deck so you can go in and find this slide. I have a couple examples of single point rubrics. This one right here is an eighth grade ELA anchor rubric. Click out to it. So in this case, you'll see it's just the ELA anchor and all the pieces. And what I might have is students may be doing a task, whatever that task may be. And it might be that in this case, the students get choice and product. Their product just has to show me that they can do these three things. And then in a conference that I would have with the student is I would click on these things, or if I can't conference, I might click on these things and just type my comments in. So I might include that commentary for each one. Or I might go out to Vakaru, record that audio, and paste that in my comments here. And then I would make sure that I would share this rubric with the students as the way of giving feedback on whatever choice in product that they've given me. So it's a, this is a great way to think about how you might give students feedback on things when the product maybe seems arbitrary, where you're like, well, this student did a flyer, and this student did this, and this student did this. If I keep my rubric criteria based on my standards or my anchors or whatever it is my goal is, then it's as simple as I'm looking at it to see that evidence was cited. I, I clearly give this rubric to my students and say these are the things that have to be present in whatever your product is. And then I go through and I score it based on that. And maybe I have the students include a video where they're explaining, hey, this is how I cited textual evidence. This is how I did this. This is how I did that. So this might be a different way for you to adapt a task for students in your classroom. I've also included this one. It's a little bit slightly organized a little bit differently. This one's based on the ISTE standards for students. So Empowered Learner, here's the criteria. And in this case, I don't have those check boxes, but I have that evidence. So I might type in here how that student is setting personal learning goals, developing strategies to achieve and reflect over here. There's an area like the student needs to do more reflecting, I might do it over here. So this is another way that I could potentially use the single point rubric for feedback and engagement with my students. I have one specifically down here that I built around a career project I use in my classroom. Um, if you wanna see one that I've used with students, you'll see in here that it both has the standards and criteria. In some cases, they are career standards for the state of Pennsylvania. In some cases, they're ISTE standards. In some cases, they're ELA standards. Um, so it's a mixture of multiple things. And I use the same sort of concerns or meets or exceeds criteria. And what I would do when I did this is I would highlight in here where I was, where they might need to focus using my highlighting tool when I would do concerns, and then I allow the student to defend and say, this is how um, this is how I changed this, this bond to meet that criteria. And they would defend it, and then I would change their scores based upon this. But the idea is that each one is just a single point. They either have it or they don't. And I offer one point, and I multiply it by 10. There's eight different pieces. It becomes out of 80, and that's how I get my percentage for this particular rubric. So that's three different, one's a Google Sheet that you could use and adapt, one's a Google Doc that you could use and adapt, and one's an example of another Google Doc that I use with my students in my classroom. So all of those are great ways to offer feedback in a slightly different way that'll allow you to look at student creation and allow that choice in product from students where you can focus instead on your goals, your skills with the student, not just, hey, does it, is it pretty? <laughs>
kind of uh, rubric. So as I'm wrapping up, I just want to remind you that all of our LIU 12 resources here are in our webinar archives, um, which you can find here, including our YouTube site and our resource site, which is learnon.iu12.org. That's where you're going to find the calendar, which is going to have a link to any of the office hours that go with these asynchronously recorded sessions. So please feel free to go back to our, our Learn On site where you're going to find a lot of these resources. Um, lastly, if you're viewing this, there's a bit.ly down here at the bottom um, that is the fall Learn On evaluation. I'd love to hear your feedback on some of these resources and what you think of them. I encourage you to go into the slide deck. Um, if you haven't, this is the link for the slide deck itself. Go back, go into the slide deck, explore some of these resources that I've helped curate for you or, or showcase very quickly in this full hour presentation um, and, and see what will work for you. Uh, my reminder to you is that you really need to adapt. Don't adopt. Uh, find what works for you, even if it's just one thing. Um, it doesn't mean that you have to do all the things in here, but even just offering a little bit of choice and changing your feedback up maybe a little bit for your students might help engage them more when we're really dealing with these tumultuous times. Thank you so much. Again, if you need to reach out to me, my email is nabond, B-O-N-D, at iu12.org. Thank you again.